Okay, so we had a couple of our grandkids at the house recently. One of them is a three-year-old, and so, you know, you just got to love a three-year-old kid. I mean, everything you need to know about how much God loves us and cares about us, you can learn from a three-year-old because of the way that, that you interact with them. So little Callie came down the steps one day and she said, I got dressed all by myself today and my mommy helped me. <laughs> There's a little confusion there on the part of a three-year-old, yeah? So then uh, in our library, I went in there and, and when I was in Kenya a number of years ago doing um, some ministry, I was able to go to the big game park there. I forget the name of it. Does anybody remember that? The Ken No, well, right out of Nairobi. It's the, you know, you, anyway, we saw, I mean, it, it was basically uh, a free zoo. When I say free, the animals are free. <laughs> and it was just amazing. We saw these giraffe herds and things like that. So I ended up buying a giraffe in Nairobi, Kenya as sort of my souvenir of the trip. And so if you can see it up close, this one obviously is, a, is now a toy. The ears are gone. So anyway, I go into the library and there's my little three-year-old, you know, trotting around with the giraffe. And I said, Callie, I said, that's great that you're playing with that giraffe. Do you know where I got that giraffe? She said, yes. And I said, well, that's great. Where did I get that giraffe? She said, Target. <laughs> you know, little kids, uh, there's, a, there's a relationship between knowledge and being in control. And little kids, like big kids, want to feel like they're in control. You want to be in control and having knowledge or thinking you have knowledge gives you at least the illusion that you have control. We're going to look at a text this morning and see this relationship between knowledge and confusion. I'd just like you to keep in mind that as we look at these little kids, now, was, was, was there anything, is there anything evil about a little three-year-old child coming up with these ideas about what the truth is and what knowledge is and where something came from? No, not really. It just, it's, just the, it's just the nature of a three-year-old. And, and you as an adult man, is, is there really anything wicked or evil about the fact that you don't know as much as you think you know? Not really. It, it, there's just confusion. When the father looks at you, he must certainly look at you in much the same way that you would look at your three-year-old grandchild or your three-year-old child. So <clears throat> what I want to do today is, is I, I want to put before you uh, a decision. I'm going to ask you, or I'm going to give you the opportunity to make or reaffirm what appears to be the, one of the most risky decisions that a man can ever make, and that's to give up control. That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, you may not be ready to, to make or reaffirm that decision to give up control. And if you're not, I at least want you to understand what this decision is, so that when you are ready to give up control of your life, you will know what needs to be done. Open your Bibles to John chapter 9, verse 35. We're going to do a shout out today to uh, the man in the mirror men's Bible study. Hey, these guys stole our name. Oh, they are us. These are 8 to 10 men who have been meeting for 10 years on Sundays at 940 at the Violet Baptist Church in, uh, say it, Pickerington, Ohio. 
And I'd like to say thanks to these men and to Jim Rice. And would you join me in giving a warm shout out to these guys? <laughs> Hoorah! <laughs> Welcome, guys. And uh, so the talk message title today, Why the Blind Man Could See What the Others Could Not See. We have looked at this passage with respect to the blind man getting his sight. And we talked about the last time we were together that suffering is the magnificent canvas upon which God displays his power and his glory. We're going to use the, the, the end of this story, which we did not look at last time. We're going to take a turn and we're going to look at what this blind man was able to see that the others couldn't see. John chapter 9 Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. So what had been going on is that there had been this uh, big debate. There's a lot of confusion. The, the religious people, you know, you know, when you have a belief system, when you believe things for a long time, whether it's about religion or anything else, you get invested in those ideas. And, uh, you know, a made-up mind is almost impossible to change. So there is some sense in which being a little piece of clay, moldable clay, never having had any spiritual beliefs, in, in some ways, in some ways really is easier than coming up with a very uh, concrete religious worldview that you've developed. And, but, but that's what's happening here is these people are very vested in what they believe. They have a lot of knowledge. Now, I... I love knowledge, and knowledge is good. I'm a lifelong learner. I have a PhD, for crying out loud. I'm committed to knowledge. I love knowledge, and knowledge is important, useful, valuable, and we want it. But knowledge also brings with it a risk. And uh, we see this risk in this passage. Jesus heard that they had thrown the blind man who had been healed out of the synagogue and when Jesus found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And then Jesus said, you now have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And then one of the most sublime moments in Scripture, the man said, Lord I believe. And he worshiped him. Then Jesus went on to say, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Now, Jesus didn't come to for the final judgment, separating the sheep and the goats, but he came, he came to be a, 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 a line in the sand. Jesus came in the, to be a line in the sand that people would make a choice. They would go to the left or to the right. When Simeon prophesied in Luke chapter 2, he said, your son will be a sign, but many will oppose him. He, he's a line in the sand. And so that's the sense in which this judgment is taking place. Uh, people will see Jesus and they will go to the left or to the right. They will see or they'll be blind. Whoops. New string, new shirt, string. All right, verse 40. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? So these people with all this religious knowledge about the Messiah and all these preconceived ideas about what religion ought to look like, think about your own religious tradition, Think about the things that you hold to dearly that other people don't hold to so dearly. What are we blind to? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you'd not be guilty. But now you claim you can see, and so your guilt remains. There are, uh, this might be oversimplification. Well, it most certainly is oversimplification. But there are two fundamental approaches to Christianity. And they, they, 
they really are almost um, different levels of maturity. They're almost different levels of maturity. It's not that, that one is completely wrong and the other completely right, but you'll see what I'm talking about. Let me just get into it. So the, the first fundamental approach to Christianity is, to, is that God wants to bless us. God wants to bless us. That Christian life is about receiving the blessings of God. And so you know that you, when you, either now or previously, you have heard and you have thought that Christianity is about getting connected with God so that, he can, so that I can get the promises, so that I can get the blessings. And there's a whole world of Christianity out there. Uh, there's a new book out every, uh, called Every Day is Friday or Every Day Can Be Friday, uh, Being Happy or Seven Days a Week or something like that. And uh, it's by a guy. I know he's a Christian because we have men in his church. Uh, I know he's a Christian, but he, but he, he comes off as though it's, it, Christianity is all about being happy and you know, wealthy and so forth and so on. And, um, and, and there is a kernel of truth in this because the Bible talks about that. But here's the problem. When your fundamental approach is that you're always asking God for blessings, it's, about, it's a religion that's about you, not about God. You see? The other fundamental approach is to seek God's will. So you have the, so, and when you seek God's will, see, when, you, when you're looking for God's blessings, you're trying to be in control. You want to be in control. You want to have God do what you want him to do. You want to be the boss. But when your fundamental approach to Christianity is to do the will of God, and you're praying for God's will, then, then you have surrendered or you have yielded your life to God. So, I, you know, my own life, I'm, very clearly, I started out praying for blessings. I can remember one of my pastors uh, taking him to, to breakfast or lunch, I can't remember, and talking to him about the book of Proverbs and about how I was basically, I didn't know it at the time, manipulating the book of Proverbs in order to have God bless me. But I was in control. I was in control. Uh, I had my own presuppositions. You see that going on in this text. These presuppositions, they, they knew some things, but they wanted to control God. Now, a little bit different angle on that, but they wanted to control God too. And we see from this, this blind man, though, that has been healed, that he basically is just saying, keep it simple. Look again at verse 35. Jesus said, he said simply, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in the Son of Man? And who is he? You know, tell me so I can believe. You have now seen him. And then what did the guy do? He says, Lord, I believe. I believe. And he worshiped him. He wasn't trying to control Jesus. He was not trying to control Jesus, and he experienced this authentic, genuine uh, faith. So, why could he see what the others couldn't see? Why was the blind man able to see what the others could not see? Well, he just, had a, he just kept it simple. He had a simple faith. He wasn't blinded by all this, uh, this knowledge. You have to be, it's so important to be careful with knowledge, as important as it is, is that you don't allow the knowledge to blind you from the truth. And one great way that we get blinded, that I've already talked about, are these two fundamental approaches where we get that mixed up. Here's the big idea for the day. Keep it simple. Give up the control you never had anyway. Keep your faith simple. 
give up the control that you never had anyway. When Elizabeth saw Mary, and they were both now pregnant with children, Mary with the Lord, she said, Mary, she said, you are blessed because you believe the Lord would do what he said. Very simple. Mary, you're blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Do you just believe that the Lord will do what he said? Or are you trying to work God? Are you trying to control him? Are, do you think of Christianity as, as a way of getting God to bless you? If you do, then you have a three-year-old faith. It doesn't mean that you don't believe. It just means that, that to, even to me, well, certainly to God, and even to me, and maybe some of the more men, uh, mature Christian men that you know, you look like a three-year-old. It's, it's not that we think you're evil. It's not that he thinks that you're evil because you're selfish. It's just that you're immature. But I'm here to tell you, men, it's, it's time to move on. It's time to move on from just praying that God will bless you and, and, and that you can be in control of your life. It's time to yield your life and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus and to seek his will. That's what this, this message is about. I'm not sure that's what this text is about, <laughs> but that is definitely what this message is about. Keep it simple. Give up control of, give up the control of what you never had control of anyway. Just like the little three-year-old. The little three-year-old's not in control. <sighs> I just love it. I dress myself all by myself, and my mommy helped me. All right, so in the text we see this, this idea that salvation is simple, but, but there is a caveat. There is a caveat. And I want you to be aware of this caveat for your own faith and for the faith of the people that you care about, okay? So s salvation is simple. Salvation is easy. It, it's, it's, you see how simple it is in this text. It's just believing in Jesus. It's putting your faith in Jesus. But there is a caveat, and the caveat is, is that your faith must be sincere. Your faith must be sincere. Let me give you an example. Julio said that, he said, I, I probably prayed the sinner's prayer at least 10 times. At least 10 times. At first, when I prayed it, I thought I would get something from it. A blessing. I thought I would get something from it. Money, good fortune, and friends. Later, when I prayed the prayer, I basically was praying it so that I could get some of my Christian friends to just leave me alone and stop bothering me. But I never meant it. I never believed. I never made Jesus Lord, not even for one minute. And then, after years of sex, alcohol, drugs, and general debauchery, God drove me to my knees. And I cried out, God, I need you. I can't do this anymore. I give my life to you. And God transformed his life. Now, there can be all kinds of theological debates about when Julio became a Christian. I would just suggest to you that that particular night, after all those years, he stopped being a three-year-old. He stopped, he stopped treating faith like, he stopped praying for what he could get out of Christianity. He stopped praying for the blessings, and he yielded himself in surrender to the will of God. So my question is, have you done that? Have you made that decision? Which seems awfully risky to give up control of your life, or, or do you need to reaffirm that decision? Or 
have you not even really understood this distinction before between praying for God's blessings versus praying for the will of God? Two totally, fundamentally different approaches to Christianity. The big idea today is this. Keep it simple. Give up the control that you never had anyway. When, you, when you're trying to work God to... How many of you are salesmen? Raise your hands. Okay. A lot of us are salespeople. And uh, what do we do? What do we do? We want something. And so we develop a very persuasive argument to make that happen. We, we're, we're trained to try to control the events, right? We want the blessing that will come from the sale, right? We want to be blessed. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. Thank God for salesmen. Thank God for the, the processes that keep things moving in the economy. But when we get to our faith in Jesus, he doesn't want you to be trying to persuade him. He doesn't want you to be working him. He doesn't want you to try to be in control. In fact, what he wants you to do is to give up control of your life. What an incredibly risky decision to consider. So how do we do that? How do we keep it simple? Here's what changed my life. I, um, I, I spent the first 14 years of my spiritual journey praying for blessings, trying to, to be in control of my life. Basically, when I became a Christian, in many ways, I merely added Jesus to my life as another interest. I already had my life, and I, liked, I actually liked my life pretty much. There are parts of it I didn't like. That's why I wanted Christ. But I, I, didn't want, I didn't really want him to come and make over my life. What I really wanted him to do was to help me do what I already wanted to do anyway better. And so, so I just sort of added him to my uh, life. And then I began to, to work him, to try to work him, to, to get him to bless me. So, for example, I would have, uh, as a real estate developer, I would have a piece of property that I had under contract. Maybe we wanted to put some kind of, well, not maybe, but we wanted to put some kind of a building on it. And you have to go through all the regulatory approvals. And so the contract, uh, the term, uh, the closing date was coming up, and I didn't have all my approvals, and so I needed some more time. And the seller would not give me the time. So I would go to God, and I would, I would, I would pray for a blessing. I would bargain with God. Now, I'm going to caricature this, but barely. So I would say something like, like God, I just really need the seller to change his mind. And here's, here's what I'm proposing. If you, if, if, you, uh, you, if you will meet with me and let me talk to you about this and make my case, you know, I'm a salesman, so I'm going to use an alternate of choice close with him. I say, if you could meet with me at 5 o'clock this afternoon or 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, I'd really like to talk this over with you. Which of those two times would be better for you? <laughs> and he would always say something like, well, Pat, you know, actually my calendar is pretty open. I can pretty much meet with you anytime you want. Great. I'll see you at 8 o'clock in the morning because I needed to stay up late that night to get my ducks in a row. So I would go and pray with God at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'd say, now, God, I've got this situation. The seller won't extend, and I need the extension. Otherwise, I'm going to you know, lose all the money uh, that I put into the engineering and all this, and it's going to be catastrophic. Can't really. So here's, here's what I'm going to propose. If you will intervene and change the seller's mind, I will commit to split the profits with you 50-50, and we'll both be better off. <laughs> what do you think? Now, as, as, utterly, as utterly ludicrous as that sounds, that is the way that I was living my life. 
And I would just like to ask you to do a little self-examination and ask yourself, do you live like that? Do you live like that? Well, um, the, the vacuous hollowness of that approach got to me at the 14-year mark, and I came to a, a, a point of yielding my life, and so I wrote in the front of this, this Bible, which is a gift from my kids, I wrote, I want to live the rest of my earthly life for the will of God, and really meant it, still do. At the time, I thought I was doing God a favor, you know, uh, lucky God, imagine what he can do now that I'm on his will, you know, and so... Uh, but here's the risk. This is, this is why giving up control of your life seems like su such a risky decision. And you should understand this. When I was in control of my life, life was, was, was not perfect, but it was pretty doggone good. But when I switched from asking God for his blessings to asking God for his will, wow. It's as though God said, wow, Pat, I, now that I really have your attention here, I have a lot of things I need to show you. And so he, he basically started this process of me living the rest of my earthly life for his will by crushing me <laughs> like a bug. So how, how, do you, how many of you want to make that decision now? But here's the thing, short-term pain, long-term gain. Just think about, or at least I think about, what would have happened in my life if I had kept seeking God's blessings instead of turning to seek, seeking his will. I know what would have happened to me. You know what would happen to you. Maybe it's already happened. That doesn't mean you can't be redeemed. But I know what would have happened to me. I would be a bitter, angry person. I'd be filthy, stinking, rich. I would be flying all over the country in, in a private aircraft. And I would be divorced. I would be alienated from my children. And I would be utterly alone. I know that about myself. I know that about myself. So that's the decision. Do you, do you make the decision that appears to be very, very risky to give up control of your life or reaffirm that decision or do you just keep trying to be in control? Big idea here today is this. Again, keep it simple. Give up the control you never had anyway. You never really had the control because remember, even though you think you're in control, you look like a three-year-old to the rest of us. Now, you may not be ready to make this decision today, but at least now you know what it is. Am I going to, am I going to treat Christianity as something where I go and pray to get God to bless me? Or am I going to treat Christianity as something where I pray to do the will of God? Those are two fundamentally different approaches. And for those of you who are ready to make the decision or reaffirm the decision, let's do that now in prayer. Our dearest Father, we come to you humbly. Lord, it does seem like a risky decision to give up control. It does. And it would be, it would be a falsification of the gospel to promise men, Lord, that if they would give up control and seek your will, that life is going to get better. It may not. It actually, for a season, may get worse. But we know, God, every one of us hearing these words right now, we know that this is true. 
that the life we want will not ultimately come because we keep praying for blessings and making it about us. Ultimately, we, we do know that your spirit is telling our spirits right now that ultimately the way that we will experience true joy is when we give up control of our lives to the will of God. And so, Father, right now, by faith, and if you want to, say this in your own brain, however you want to, we give up control. We want to keep it simple. We recognize we never really had control anyway. We realize that we must look to you like a three-year-old. Lord, we do believe, but we don't want our faith to be about what's in it for us and just constantly getting you to bless us. We want to grow up and be mature. And so right now, by faith, we give you control. We say, by your grace, I want to live the rest of my earthly life for the will of God. Amen. Oh,